Britain and Ireland lives entwined, shifting borders, shifting identity. Born in the late 1960s, in the beginning of the period referred to as the Troubles, it was the tension between young people from different backgrounds and religions that made them the people they were. This was the mould we fitted into. Not the multicultural mix of race and identity we know today, but the very basic binary identity of green and orange, Protestant or Catholic, Fenian or Prod, it was this that defined you. Flags were despised and revered depending on your identity and culture. Colours were tremendously important. The primary colours, not ones any artist would identify, were the two distinct camps of red, white and blue and green, white and gold, or green, white and orange, as even gold and orange had contentious meaning in the six counties. Nor in the early years of education in Armagh did the contention stop there. It went on to include many forms of symbolism and identity and language. The Irish language, in the opinion of many of the unionist community, was a statement of Irishness and anti-Britishness, used to antagonise as the wee prods couldn't understand it. Any inadvertent reference to the north of Ireland, a nationalist or republican term, or alternatively Northern Ireland, a unionist or loyalist term, or to Derry or London Derry in conversation, would define you as from or empathising with one side or the other. The list went on and on. I refer to this experience because this was normality and was regarded as normal even though it was far from such. This was a set of circumstances we'd all come to know was acceptable even though by anyone's standards it was a completely unacceptable situation. A deep-rooted scorn for each other that would ultimately embed prejudices and fears that would take generations to subside. This was at a time when the local area was gripped with horrors and atrocities such as the Kingsmill Massacre and the murder of the Reavy brothers at White Cross. Set against a backdrop of murder and death on a daily basis and a relentless cycle of ethnic cleansing along the border, destroying trust and cooperation between communities for decades. Friendships and partnerships built up over lifetimes would be torn apart and not rekindled for generations and, in some circumstances, never rebuilt. A damaged society would emerge built on tribal lines where survival and self-preservation were the order of the day. With communities divided along religious and cultural lines, even though most participants, especially in rural areas, were actually wholly dependent on working with each other in order to flourish from day to day. Amidst all the darkness, one recollection that continually re-emerges is that most people were fundamentally good. Most wanted to get on with their lives and businesses and just hoped and prayed because it was a deeply religious society at this time, that the violence and mayhem didn't come to their household and that some divine force would ensure that their family remained safe through it all. In fact, few were preoccupied with Irish unity or the union of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Many were quite happy to befriend or socialise with those from the other community when they were taken out of the goldfish bowl of Northern Ireland and this divisive politics. But change happens. Change is a bit like the seasons, creeping up without anyone realising. Even though expected, no one notices it happened. With the passage of time, for a variety of reasons, Northern Ireland witnessed unprecedented change. In a conflict that neither Republicans nor the British could ever win, and a struggle that would take in excess of 3,700 lives, we eventually, eventually witnessed the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, or Belfast Agreement, in 1988. The very naming, of course, had significance but it was an agreement based on the founding principles of mutual respect and parity of esteem for all, as important today as it was at the time of signing. Undoubtedly, this was a monumental moment in history, one where even though all did not agree, the vast majority of the elected representatives and leaders signed up to a commitment to move forward, one where peace and prosperity would be the priority. Future generations would never have to endure the anger violence and hatred that all had experienced for the previous 30 years. This change would deliver relative peace in the following years and even become something that many took for granted, thinking naively that once secured it could never be lost. <laughs>